Thank you all for uh, coming tonight. I'm very pleased to share this story with as many people as I can because I think it's uh, an important story. It just so happens to be my family story and it accounts for the fact that I'm here with you tonight uh, because if these events didn't happen the way they happened, I wouldn't, wouldn't be alive and our family wouldn't be. As, as was mentioned, I'm a, a professor of philosophy, uh, but I'm also a genocide studies scholar, but I'm also uh, very privileged, uh, unlike many uh, Armenian uh, descendants of survivors of those events in 1915 to 1923, I'm very privileged to have uh, a trove of both visual and written material about what happened in those years. And uh, I'm trying to share this as, as much as possible with the greater Armenian community, but I'm also uh, going to be sharing it with people in Turkey, because my work, uh, as some of you know, has uh, in the last two years has been in Turkey uh, with exhibitions of, of these photographs, hundreds more, hundreds more. And also, the story that I'm telling has been translated into Turkish, and a larger, larger book will be, will be coming out in both English and Turkish. So excuse me if I, if I read this. I'm going to sort of interrupt it every so often. Um, but I will, I'll, I'll begin by um, dedicating uh, this talk uh, to, my, to my mother, uh, this photograph. Uh, was, was taken in about 1915, just as uh, uh, matters became very uh, difficult for the family in Marzabon, uh, though you can't tell it from the photograph. Um, <clears throat> as a child growing up in New York City, and I'm a, a native of New York City, I was born in Manhattan, the little that I knew about the events of 1915 primarily came from two sources, my parents, who were genocide survivors, and my Armenian-American friends. What I knew was simple enough. An ancient 2,000-year-old nation had been ethnically cleansed from its historic homeland in what is now present-day Turkey. The few survivors were scattered across the globe in what has, been, has come to be known as the Armenian diaspora. Everything was black and white then. The Turks were the perpetrators and the Armenians the victims. My parents, very young when the genocide began, survived due to luck and circumstance. Stories of survival seemed simple enough. I did not probe my parents further about what now seems anomalies from the familiar pattern of such survival stories. The genocide narrative was simple enough, at least the one that I knew at the time. All Armenians were rounded up in towns and villages, put on deportation caravans, and massacred en route, or died from the rigors of their march into the Syrian desert. The few who survived either settled in the Middle East or emigrated to nations around the world. Yet my, my parents' story varied from this pattern. My mother's father, a professional photographer, was spared from the deportation because the Ottoman military and the local government needed his skills as a photographer. He was able to save his immediate family members who lived in Marzavan. Um, but all the rest of the family in Sivas, in Amasya, in Samsun, in Vezrikopru, in Trabzon, they all perished. Um, if you don't <coughs> know where uh, Marasvan is, it's in the north, south of Samsun, near, near the Black Sea. <coughs> um, this is... Um, this is a, a map of present-day Turkey, so the names are 
primarily Turkish. <clears throat> uh, after the First World War, my family who had survived attempted to restart their lives in Turkey, but were eventually forced to leave due to the rise of Mustafa Kemal and his nationalist forces. First Greece and then the United States became their homes. Now my, my father's story had an element in it that I found odd at the time, but I did not question. My grandfather had emigrated, this is my father's father, to the United States before the First World War, but his wife, my grandmother, and children were left behind in their village near Palu, and Palu is indicated by that arrow in the, uh, in the southeast, not far from Kharpert or Kharput. Um, the family survived the initial deportations due to the protection offered them by an Islamized uncle. This Islamized relative had converted many years earlier in order to gain release from the Sultan's prison. He had married a Kurdish woman and was living in a remote mountain location. Eventually, my grandmother and my father would make their way to Aleppo while his two siblings would perish on the journey. As with my mother's family, my father would eventually settle in the United States where he met my mother and married and I was born. Now, who was this Islamized Armenian relative, a man who played a, a crucial role in, the sa in saving my father's life, saving him from certain death, yet a man never named and little mentioned again in the family lore. I had always been taught that Christianity lay at the core of the Armenian identity, an identity forged in 301 AD when the nation adopted Christianity. Christianity was central to survival over the course of nearly two millennia of domination by other peoples and empires. While I know very little about the role this Islamized relative played in my father's story, I know much more about the role of Islam in my mother's survival story. Strangely enough, I suspect that I know much more than my mother herself ever knew. So this is the story. This is the story that I'm, I'm going to uh, tell you. Um, can you. Can you turn the light back down? I always like to talk in the dark a little. <laughs> uh, this, uh, there's a, some photos over there on, on my left there a panorama of Marzavan. This is the same, uh, same photo, and if I can get this to work, uh, nope, I cannot. Um, oh, there it is. Excuse me. So, this, this, is, this is the city where my mother's family, the Dildilians, resided for about 25 years until they were forced to leave by Kemal Ataturk. Those are all Armenian schools on the hillside. Um, and this photograph contains both my grandfather's house and his sister's house. And I'll show you some enlargements later. But some of you may know Anatolia College. All these white buildings are Anatolia College, uh, which was a, a major educational institution in that part of, of the, uh, the country. Uh, really outside of, of uh, Constantinople, it was one of the leading educational institutions in, in the Ottoman Empire or in certainly in Anatolia. You're seeing it again. I don't want to show it again, but. Okay. Well, I want to, be, I want to begin with this photograph. 
Uh, one I saw m many years ago when I was casually browsing through an old family photograph album. It was a strange photograph of people I did not recognize. Years later, this photograph and the glass negative from which it was taken, and uh, I'm fortunate to have not only eight, nine hundred photographs from the Ottoman period, but I also have hundreds of glass negatives that somehow made it from Anatolia to Samsun to Greece to Connecticut. No. Um, so as I said, many, uh, this photograph and its, its, its uh, negative are, are now my possession. Now having learned from my mother the, the rough outlines of the family's survival story, I had by then some appreciation of the context of many of these inherited photographs, yet details were missing. My mother, whose photograph you saw, was born in 1911 and was quite young at the time of the genocide. Much of what she knew she learned from her parents and older brothers. Years later, after my mother passed away, I learned that she did not know many of the elements of their survival story and was probably kept in the dark or intentionally kept in the dark about them. And I learned of these beginning in 2009 when I started delving into a large written record left by surviving relatives. I will use this photograph then to tell a very tiny portion of this story, this survival story. Now my sources for this story include a book-length manuscript written by my great uncle Aram Dildilian and a transcript of a lengthy speech given by my grandfather Tsolag Dildilian. Tsolag and Armin were brothers and had established themselves as photographers with studios in Samsun in Amasya, in Konya, and also in Marzova. But the most important details were found in a memoir written by my grandfather's niece, Maritza Medaxian, uh, that had been recovered and edited by my cousin Haig der Haratunyan in Paris. For it was here that I came upon a startling discovery, an account of my family's conversion to Islam and the adoption of Turkish identities. When I made this discovery, I was shocked. Uh, I, had I, I had been completely ignorant of this event. While my mother was too young to recall the conversion, her older brothers, my uncles, were certainly old enough to remember, and they're mentioned specifically in the, mem in the notes. Uh, as being there during the conversion. One can only speculate as to why they chose to keep a secret, a secret from their own sister. No one in my generation knew this secret. Uh, I had in front of me a richly detailed day-by-day -day account of the events leading up to the August 10th, 1915 conversion. Needless to say, this was not a voluntary conversion, for it was done under the coercive pressure of a violent and in most cases fatal deportation. From missionary accounts, and the missionaries were important in founding this, this college, Anatolia College, from missionary accounts I learned that the date of August 10th, 1915 coincided with the tragic date in Anatolia College's history, the college for which my grandfather worked as a photographer. For it was on this date that the Armenian professors, staff, students, and their families who had sought sanctuary on the college campus were forced into the deportation marches and led to their deaths. And there's a photograph over there of many of the professors, about eight of them uh, perished uh, in the deportation. Uh, two, of them, two of them survived, but that's another story. Uh, the months preceding this fateful day in August were marked with escalating fear and violence, the direct result of which was the mass conversion 
of Armenians to Islam. Combining a variety of sources, I have reconstructed an almost day-to-day -day account of those horrific spring and summer months of 1915. Now, I cannot provide the full narrative here, though a published account in both Turkish and English will appear uh, sometime early in 2015. Instead, I will provide a short summary of my story. The first stage of the genocidal process in Marzovan began on April 29th, 1915. Political leaders of the Armenian community, mostly Hunchaks, were arrested and soon sent off to Sivas for execution. On June 2nd, orders were given that all firearms and army deserters be turned over to the government. Many complied, especially after the urging of their religious leaders. Yet on June 26th, upwards of 1,200, 1,200 males between the ages of 20 and 45 were arrested and jailed in the city's military barracks. As I said, uh, 1,200 males between the ages of 20 and 45 were arrested and jailed in, in the city's military barracks. This is an older photograph of the barracks that my grandfather had taken. Now, among the, the jailed, the detainees, was uh, a man named Garabed Keremijan, who was uh, one of the Armenian notables of the town, whose personal and financial relationships with the local government officials proved cr crucial in negotiating the fate of the prisoners. Karamidjan first persuaded the prisoners to turn over any weapons that they still had hidden in their homes, which they did. But soon he noticed that small chain-bound groups of detainees were being removed from the barracks at night. Having inquired with the gendarme commander, Mahir Bey, what was going on, he was informed that these men were being deported to Aleppo. Karamidjan eventually persuaded Mahir Bey to accept a fee of 50 Turkish gold lira each to allow those who desired to convert to Islam and thus escape deportation and death. First-hand reports of the cruelties witnessed in the barracks are contained in the family memoirs. Uh, there's some horrific accounts in the memoirs of what happened in the barracks, also what happened to the individuals who were taken in the small groups outside of the barracks and uh, executed. Ironically, uh, well, the, then the first mass conversions in Marzavan took place at the end of June and the beginning of July, 1915. Ironically, Interior Minister Talat Pasha had just at this time ordered a halt to most conversions when he realized that too many Armenians were willing to convert in order to escape death, undermining the Committee of Union and Progress's plan to reduce the number of Armenians uh, to under 10% of each Sanjaks, that's each province's population. The official deportation orders for Marzavan were announced on July 4th. While the number of com converts may be somewhat exaggerated, Keremidjan concludes that, quote, about 3,000 persons, wives, old ones, children, were converted. Keremidjan then reports that the 10% rule was implemented and only 1,200 who had already paid their bribe could stay, while the remaining 1,800 converts were deported. And there was some upset uh, among the authorities because now they were deporting Muslims. Um, but 
The most important thing was that they were Armenian and had to go. Karamijian further reports that a significant portion of the Protestant Armenians converted, while most Catholic and Orthodox or Apostolic Armenians refused to do so. By August, the only non-converted Armenians remaining in Marzavan were those on the Anatolia College campus and the surrounding neighborhood, including my family, the Dildillians and his sister, uh, Maritz, uh, um, um, Der Haratunian family. Um, the leaders of Anatolia College had successfully bribed local officials to protect the Armenian staff and students. All this hard work was for naught when the gendarmes finally entered the campus and deported the Armenians on August 10th. My grandfather Tzolag was warned by Mahir Bey, the commander of the, the gendarmes, that the protection he was afforded could not continue without conversion. After much argument within the family and the encouragement of the Karamijan, uh, of, of Garabed Karamijan, the family converted on the afternoon of August 10th. With the conversion, the stage is now set to return to that, that puzzling photograph. And, okay. Um, let me now ask some questions about this photograph. Some simple, others more, more difficult. When was this photograph taken? Where was it taken? Who is in the photograph? What are these people doing in the photograph? What is the message these individuals are trying to convey in this photograph? The final question, and the most important for the purposes, our purposes here, is how did these individuals come to be in this particular place at this particular time for this photograph to be taken? Now the answer to the first question, when was it taken, is established by the banner hanging on the wall behind that reads in Armenian, Hisus Zanav, 1916. This translates to Jesus was born, 1916. The individuals in this photograph are celebrating Christmas. In this particular case, Armenian Apostolic Christmas, which is traditionally celebrated on January 6th. We know from accounts in the memoirs that uh, Haiganush, uh, Der Haratunian, my grandfather's sister, my great aunt, who's pictured in this photograph uh, leaning on her left arm. Uh, this is Haiganush. We know from the, the memoirs that the first Christmas that was celebrated by these Islamized Armenians uh, was at her house. Um, she was a devout apostolic, unlike my grandfather, Tzolag, who was a Protestant. The memoirs mentioned that the first Christmas after the deportations were, were celebrated here. So we've answered that first question. Um, and if I can, oh. This is just a photograph of the Karamijan house as it looks today, uh, the wealthiest Armenian's house in, in, in Marzavan. I think it needs a little work. This is uh, just a list of, in Turkish, uh, of 307 uh, Armenians and their, their Turkish names. Um, it's the exemptions in the implementation of the law of relocation of Armenians in, in in Marzavan. And uh, if you look at this list, here is my grandfather, uh, poorly transliterated, but it's supposed to be Tzolag Dildilyan, it's Dildisyan, but his name, Turkish name was Ahmed Nuri, 
and it has his occupation here as, um, as a photographer. Okay? But this is just the small list of the Armenians and the Turkish names. And, and down at the bottom is his brother, Aram, who became Osman. And it says he was topal, which means he was lame. He had an amputated, amputated leg. Um, so this is, uh, this is Aram, if I can get this up here. That's Aram right here and his sister. This is a sketch of the house where the photograph was taken, done by memory um, by the son of Haiganush, Aram, in 1978. When I took that, that large panoramic photograph, I matched it up with this house. So this is the only photograph we have of the house where the Christmas celebration was taken. But it was from that drawing by memory that I was able to. And then a year ago, <clears throat> I went looking for the house. Um, you can see this is the house in the photograph of the Der Hotunian. And my grandfather's house with the glass ceiling for the photography studio is up in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, you can see his house is much closer to the college. This, this is what that house, the site where the house where Christmas was celebrated in 1916 looks uh, a year ago or even less than a year ago when we went searching for the location. As you can see, the house is, is no longer there. Let me uh, move on to the story. Now, answering the third question, who is in the photograph, takes us directly to the topic of the individuals rescued by my family during these years of the genocide. The five males pictured in, the, in this photograph are all relatively young men who would have been of draft age. Young males were called up for military service prior to the deportations. Conversion to Islam may have enabled one to avoid the deportations, but did not exempt one from conscription. Aram Dildilian, who I pointed out, was a, exempt because of his being lame and had uh, an artificial leg. Um, the four other young men pictured here would be considered deserters at this point and would have been subject to arrest and immediate execution. And so would our family who was hiding them at this time. Almost all Armenians serving in the Ottoman army had been disarmed and placed into labor battalions after Enver Pasha's directive of February 25, 1915. By spring, many of these soldiers were being slaughtered en masse. The four young men in this photograph had been hidden in Haiganusha's house since late summer 1915. Through various sources, we've been able to identify the four. Um, and these are the names of the four individuals, Khachador, Gorgodian, Haig, Felician, Garabed, Medaxian, and Lemuel Sherinian. He's playing a musical instrument down at the bottom. Um, Khachador, Haig, and Lemuel had all been students at the college, while Garabed was an instructor in the college carpentry shop. Here he is pictured um, in this next photograph. This is Lemuel Sherinian in his happier days uh, at the college. He was a very talented musician. He survived, and when I gave a talk in, in California, I met a friend of his who used to play music with him in Santa Monica. Uh, and these are uh, Lemuel Haig and Aram, the fourth person we haven't been able to identify. Now, the, the, the quick next question is, what are these people doing? It's already been partially answered. They're celebrating Christmas. In addition to the Bible that's being held here and the cross that, that um, 
Kachador is holding, are a number of objects that would be used in a mass. And this is, this is just an enlargement from that same photograph, including uh, a wafer and a glass of what appears to be water, a candlestick with a candle missing, and an incense holder. Could the missing candle and possibly incense holder reflect the reality of their deprivations, yet still symbolize their faith in persevering? The family here is documenting this Christmas celebration for, I believe, posterity, and simultaneously affirming their true faith, despite having outwardly adopted their oppressor's faith. There may also be a political message here. The flag that you see on the table has three horizontal stripes and two oblique bands with three stars in each. This flag resembles the flag of the Society of Armenian Students of Geneva. Geneva was the center of uh, the diasporan Armenian nationalist activity in the 1890s. Both the Social Democratic Hunchakian Party, the Hunchaks, and the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, the Tashnaks, were active in Geneva, with the former being founded by Armenian university students. The photograph is thus a statement of resistance, resistance spiritually and in the name of the nascent Armenian nation. We now have come to the final question regarding this old photograph and the topic of the survival of the Armenians in Marzavan. How did these individuals come to be in this particular place at this particular time? I will try to summarize how this came to pass. Neighborhood by neighborhood, the deportations continued from late June into July. At first, Haiganush expands the family's hiding place but after seeing her Armenian neighbors violently forced out of their houses, she decides in July to move into her brother's house across the street from the college campus. Her brother Tsalag had been exempted from the deportations by Maher Bey. Tsalag, and this is all before the conversion, okay? Tsalag had close personal and professional ties to the college. His brothers and children were students there. He was the college's photographer. He even operated the college's x-ray machine the, and ran the stationary store uh, concession at the college. As the deportations continued into July, the Armenian male students gradually became aware that the college could no longer protect them. Three of them, Havanes, Hagop, and Garabed, I'm not going to repeat all the last names, okay? close friends of Tsalag's younger brother, Aram, agreed that when the time came for the deportations, they would escape to the remote countryside of the Greek village of Galassin. A Greek classmate of theirs, Andreas, had agreed to help them once they reached their destination. Their plan was to live off the land and rough it through the autumn and winter, hoping that by spring, the Ottoman armies on the collapsing Russian front would be defeated. Earlier, they had buried rifles, ammunition, hatchets, and other equipment in hiding places on the college campus. They would use these rifles to live off the land by hunting, but soon they realized that their access to these weapons would be cut off once the deportations began. It was also illegal for an Armenian to have a weapon at this time. They obtained a promise from Aram my great uncle, that once the campus had been cleared, he would return and smuggle the weapons across the street to his brother's house. They would attempt to break off from the deportation caravan and return to collect their supplies. The fateful day of the deportation of the Armenians of the college arrived, August 10th, 1915. And this has been described in detail in many of the missionary accounts. 
There are also detailed accounts in the memoirs of Aram and Maritza as to what transpired on the campus and its environments that day. Earlier that day, Aram was working in one of the joinery shops on campus. Mr. Getchell, his, the college dean, warned him of the arrival of the gendarmes who had come to deport the Armenian professors, staff, and students and their families. He, would, was, he was advised to run home across the street. He slipped out of the gate of the college and he returned home. Uh, the family home is on the far right. Um, the college houses are across the street. Those are two of the houses of the professors. Um, but this area was all inhabited by the uh, Armenian professors connected to the college. Uh, the families gathered, the, my Dildilian family and the Haratunian family, gathered on the top floor of the house and watched in disbelief as the Armenians, along with few of their belongings, were loaded into oxen carts and marched off into the countryside. The upper floors of their house provide a good vantage point for observing the activities in the surrounding residential neighborhood. This is just a map of the college, but this is another picture of the house um, taken just before the war. Um, this is the house as it exists today. It's still there. It's occupied by a Turkish family that moved into the house a few years after our family uh, left. A very welcoming family. I visited many times. They tell me it's my home. I can return anytime. Um, No, I'm, I'm, I'm actually serious. They are uh, very, um, very uh, genuine about their offers of, of visits. They were, they were part of the population exchange with the Greeks in 1922-23. They lost their home outside of Salonika in Greece. So their family has a story of being forced to leave from their home. So when they came and occupied this home, they learned the history of the family that left and they knew that they were photographers. So when I arrived, they, they welcomed me home. Just going back to the, to the memoir, uh, Aram comments at this point, and I'm quoting from the memoir, it was a tragic scene to watch. One by one, all the oxen carts came out of the main gate where soldiers with bayonets on both sides watched them closely. All our dear and able professors, teachers with their wives and children, and all, uh, and all the college students and workers, with tearful eyes, we watched them go one by one, our last hope of the survival of the nation's cream. Um, this is just a photograph in the collection of oxen carts being used for what they normally are for the harvest and not for deporting human beings to their, to their deaths. This theme of the survival of the nation's cream clearly motivates Aram and his family and um, his sister and his brother in their efforts to rescue the few Armenians who managed to avoid or escape the deportations. These educated young men and women of Anatolia College who were hidden by the family for upwards of two years provide the hope that the nation will be reborn once the war ends. These endeavors of rescue and refuge begin almost immediately. The promise that Aram had made to his college friends, Hovhaness, Hagop, and Garabed, had to be kept. The three friends would make an attempt to escape from the deportation caravan return to Tzolag Dildilian's house in the cover of darkness, be provisioned with supplies, and make their way uh, to the nearby mountains. Late on the night of August 10th, the young men arrive at my grandfather's house and are temporarily hidden in the neighbor's abandoned house. Aram's memoir describes the lengths to which he went in order to secretly bring the weapons from the college back to his friends hidden next door. Because he was lame and he had a wooden leg, uh, he was able to put the rifles into his pants and no one noticed the stiffness as he walked the rifles one by one across the street. Um, 
Aram's uh, memoir, just, uh, I already said that, Solarg and his wife, uh, Mariam, my grandmother, supply the men with food and blankets. They set off to the mountains. Aram keeps in touch with them through go-betweens, even providing them medicine when one of them falls ill. So the story of their escape is told to the family and recorded in, in two of the memoirs. The young college men escaped the deportation caravan when it had paused at a monastery just outside the town. While resting at the monastery, they were asked by an Islamized Armenian who was uh, working at the monastery, the farm of the monastery, to help repair some of the broken farm equipment. They take the opportunity to hide and with the assistance of a friendly neighborhood Turkish policeman, Apek Aga, they made their way back to my grandfather's house. Maratza's memoir contains an emotionally upsetting account. Garabed's caravan also included his mother and sister. For practical reasons, the plan of escape and the mountain refuge could not include these women and Garabed was forced to leave them to their fates. Garabed's mother gives him her coat and his sister gives him her christening medal to sell in order to pay for his survival. And I quote from Maritz's account, Garo and his companions then go and hide amidst the wheat stalks. Some moments later, the transportation caravan sets out and when his mother and sister walk past him, Garo wants to rush forward, but his companions hold him back because their hiding place would have been revealed. In any way, of what help would he have been to his mother and his sister? He would have been executed before the caravan reached the field of irises. This was a vast field of land covered with blue, white, and yellow irises. This, and ending the quote, this was the last time that Garabed saw his family. No one knows when or where they perished. One can only wonder if it took place in that field of blue, blue, white, and yellow irises. This is, um, this is a picture of me trying to find the monastery. Um, and in the memoir, it mentions a large tree, um, chestnut tree. And uh, we went, asked some of the farmers, and they pointed us to the chestnut tree. Then we, uh, we noticed this fountain, and this is too elaborate a fountain for, uh, for a rural farm. Um, it was clearly a remnant of the monastery. And then we went, we were allowed to go into the back to the barn, and I looked at the barn. I looked at the roof of the barn and I said, that's not how you build a roof of a barn. So we, we opened the doors uh, and this is the inside of three chapels inside that barn and you can see the, uh, some of the coloring is still there of the apostles around uh, the, uh, the roof. It's just piled up with uh, hay for the animals. Um, I'm, I'm, my next effort is to work with some of the locals in this town to preserve the remnants of this monastery. There are people there who were devout Muslims who were with me at this time that were very embarrassed by seeing this. Um, um, but as you can see, there's not much left um, to save. And I'm just going to skip this. This is the next door neighbor's professor's house. Um, uh, winter in the mountains proved unbearable for these young men and they eventually returned to my great aunt Haganush's house where Aram had already enlarged the secret hiding place. This is how Garabed Bandaxian came to find himself in that Christmas photograph. Upon the arrival of, of the four young men, Aram began to build a more secure permanent place. And there's lots of descriptions of this, I'll just quote one of them. We built a very safe and comfortable underground hiding place in two sections so that in case one section was found, the back section would be safe. I made a fresh air ventilation system and there was room enough for eight persons in this underground space. 
I put up a watchtower with mirrors to look and see in every direction so that the lookout would signal the boys to go down in case of suspicious people. Now, they weren't in the underground hiding place for two years. They would be up in the house, but if there was any danger, they would go underground. So I end that quote. More easily detectable hiding places were made around the property, so that if the police searches found these fake hiding places uh, empty, they would assume then that no one was hidden in the house. Secretly at night, they increased the height of the family compound's outer walls by adding sun-baked bricks. So every day it was higher and higher. This is just a sketch of what the house uh, layout was. Now soon the four uh, hideaways were joined by Khachador Gorgadyan, the second of the four men in that photo, along with his brother, who had hidden themselves in a the, in nearby abandoned house. Now six young men were hiding in the house, but the story does not end here, for more were yet to come. Aram describes the arrival of Lemuel Sherinian, his classmate, the talented musician that I showed you a picture of earlier. Now Lemuel had been hiding on the college campus until the college campus president, because the college kept operating just with its Greek uh, students after the Armenians were deported. Um, Aram continues, later we got Haratun who was hiding by himself in a silk factory in the countryside, and then Miran was trying to hide here and there. Haig Felician managed to hide himself in an attic at the college room. Now we had 10, too many to keep in one place, and too dangerous for safe keeping, end of quote. Eventually, eight young women from the Anatolia College School who feared being taken into Turkish families as brides would join them, requiring a further expansion of the hiding places. With Haganush and her five children, a total of 23 were living in the household at one point in this space. At the same time that Aram and Haganush were hiding these young people, an unknown number of young men were hidden in my grandfather's house, the one with the photography studio near the, near the college. Many years later, my mother would recall to me uh, experience as a young girl, recall the sudden appearance and disappearance of young men in the household. No adult would acknowledge their presence, making her wonder if she had been seeing apparitions in the house. Uh, neither Tsolag nor Haiganush, the brother and sister, knew the details of each other's activities in hiding these young men. A mutual ignorance may well have been a safety strategy. The less one knew of each other's activities, the less the likelihood of a coerced betrayal of each other. We have now solved that mystery of those four young men in the photograph, Garabed, Khachador, Lemuel, and Haig, how they came to be in, in that Christmas photograph celebration. A celebration ironically taking place in a household ostensibly Islamized and Turkified. I would like to conclude my story with, the, with words, not with words, but with an image. Uh, the heroes of the story are Solag, Aram and Haiganush, the three siblings who risked their lives to save their fellow human beings and whose heroism has never been fully recognized. Thank you. Shonar Galim.